Hi, thanks for tuning in. It's a beautiful spring day today here on the north coast of New South Wales in Australia. Spring is really kicking in. The bees are really, really active. We've got a bunch of hives that are really busy. This yellow hive here, I think I split on camera a couple of weeks ago, but you can see the population is just really bumped back up really quickly. And we've got lots of honey in, in the hive coming in. So I thought we'd do a harvest today to start with, and then we'll jump onto another hive and go and do a type of split that I was talking about last time. So we're all set up, ready to go. I'm just gonna use two keys today. You can use one. You can uh, harvest the hive incrementally. You can put your key in a little ways and crack it if it's easier and a little way more. But a nice quick way of doing it where you get a lot of leverage is to just use two keys and bring them together like that. When the frames fall, it can be really quite tricky to, um, to crack, require a lot of force. And then you can just leave the key in for a little bit just to make sure those moving parts actually move because the bees stick it together quite well. And see that honey coming out, yum. Oh, tastes like macadamia honey to me. And the macadamias are flowering just down in the valley. So the bees are going straight down the hill. Let's do this other one here. That was a little bit easier to crack. Look at that beautiful honey. So this hive probably needs to be split again, which is pretty crazy, but it's all part of spring management where we're trying to basically reduce the population of bees in the hive so that they don't swarm on us. The swarming is the natural tendency of the bees. It's the way they reproduce their colony. So if you think of a colony as a superorganism and the bees as individual cells in that superorganism, then it's easy to see that the superorganism needs to split itself and move elsewhere to propagate itself. So we'll put some, sorry Trace, no. <laughs> after you. Just making myself comfortable there, babe. If you've got any questions, please um, type them into the comments below and we'll try and get to them. And we'll just get our little beeswax cloth here and we'll put that over the top of the jars so that no bees can get into our honey. We can just leave those keys in for now. And just seal that up nice and tight. So we'll go over to this other hive, which is looking fairly busy. A couple of weeks ago, I briefly talked about a way of splitting the hive where you didn't need to find the queen. Um, we can call it a vertical split, I guess. It's using another brood box and a queen excluder. So basically what happens is you pull frames out of this brood nest here and you shake all the bees off the brood so that all the bees and the queen just stays in that box. Then you take your new brood box, put those brood frames in there and stick it above the queen excluder and below your super. All the nurse bees will smell that brood and they'll go up through the, through the queen excluder and take care of the brood because um, that's their instinct. And then the queen won't be able to pass through um, and you can leave it for five, eight, 24 hours and come back and just take the box off, put it on your new bottom board in its new location and the, as long as you've got eggs in the split, that split will make a new queen. So it's just a handy way of not having to find the queen. You see we've got a little gecko up here. He's living in the warmth under the roof. I guess he likes eating the ants. Oh, lots of honey in this box. You can see the bees are pretty packed in here. It's starting to get quite busy, so it's probably a good one to split. 
I'll just get my smoker. Let's put a little bit of smoke in the entrance. You can see the landing board's looking fairly busy. Lots of bees coming and going. And that's the good thing about having a flow super is you can look at the landing board, check how busy they are, and then you can look in the windows and see what the population's like. We'll pull this side window off too and get an idea. You can see they're pretty, pretty packed in there. Heaps of beautiful capped honey ready to harvest. So Pete, would you call that a pretty packed hive, like you were sort of saying? Well, like, yeah, it's, it's getting there. I reckon it's um, another couple of weeks and it'll be really bumper. Um, so we might just try and get to it before it reaches peak population. Um, sometimes you can see in between the, the um, frames where the bees can't even move, they just kind of struggle to get past each other. But you can see these guys are still travelling or okay. Alright. Should wear my suit. <laughs> Do you like your jacket? Whoa, look at them there. Let's see if they're feisty or not. They seem to be a little bit. I might put my jacket on. Or at least my hat. Hey hey Pete, Philip's coming from Florida, USA, and just wondering are there any benefits to having multiple brood boxes on one hive? Like giving the queen free range of two to three boxes? Yeah, it can be a really effective way to make room in your colony and prevent swarming. It also can be really good to have a really strong brood nest if you've got a if you've got a cold winter sliding down the hill um, so that you've got plenty of plenty of bees and plenty of brood to survive that winter a nice big cluster. Oh, you see these bees are pretty active I'm just going to twist the excluder off and look for the queen underneath. She, there's a small chance she'll be on there. I oh, can't see her. Just lean that against the hive. Somewhere. Is that a lot of honey on that excluder, Pete? Yeah. You can see the bees are running out of room. Let's flick them off. Um, when they sort of start running out of room, they just start stashing honey everywhere. So we'll just pull the frame out and see what's on it. We're looking for brood. So we could go straight to the middle, but you might find there's a lot of brood across the whole box. I'll we'll just start second in. So on this side, I can see lots of drone cells. And they are these bulbous cappings here. They need those, they need the extra room because the drones are bigger. So here's the drone here compared to the workers here. The drones have got those big eyes. And they're quite a lot bigger than the workers, so they've got that convex capping, and here's the flat worker capping. So we're still looking for the queen. Um, and if we see her, that's great. That'll speed everything up. But if we don't see her, then that's fine too. So this frame, I'm going to just make a call that it's not going to go in the split for now, just because there's a lot of drone comb on it. And we don't necessarily want the drone cells in our split. Um, it's okay to have them. But um, it's just better to have worker brood and nurse bees. Pete, is a sign of too much uh, drone brood anything to do with the bees getting ready to swarm? It can be, but generally, just, just sort of in general it's not, but around this time of year it can be a real sign. Um, if your hive is making a lot of drones, it means there's a lot of resources 
around that they're able to collect because having drones in your hive is quite a resource heavy thing because the drones are um, they don't they don't actually gather any food for the hive they just hang out and um, fly out every day and wait for a queen to mate with um, it seems like a good life but then if they mate they die so that's a bit the brutal part on the end so that looks like quite a good frame to put in our split um, I'm on the wrong angle to see but hopefully there's some eggs down here I'll just get the sun over my shoulder yep I can't see any eggs in those cells but that's okay we've got a lot of capped brood so we want that capped brood in our split to get the split going really quickly because they'll emerge quite soon so what we do we'll shake all these bees off and um, this will put a lot of bees in the air so if you're a beginner this can be quite overwhelming having all these bees in the air but um, a lot of the time just because there's a lot in the air doesn't necessarily mean they're aggressive but these ones are a little bit stirred up already I might have to get my jacket on soon but basically you just want to shake the frame um, fairly suddenly and make sure all the bees come off. It's kind of the only time you want to not be slow and gentle when you're in a hive. So you can just see a couple of bees left here. You can see these guys are really brand new. They've just emerged. They're really fluffy and cute and they're kind of a little bit uncoordinated. They don't know where they're going. And here we can see some pollen, so that's some nice food for our split to have. And just looking, can't see the queen, which is good. So that can go in our split box. Thanks for the jacket, Chase. No worries. Everyone's a bit, everyone's a bit concerned, Pete, so just checking. <laughs> <laughs> um, it's a good idea to wear your protection if you're a new beekeeper. Um, I'm pretty comfortable not wearing it. I get stung all the time and it's fine, so. Pete, Pete, do drone bees go out each day? Yeah, they do. Around lunchtime, you can see them going out and coming back in. <laughs> Around lunchtime. Around lunchtime. That's <laughs> right. Get out of the pub, have yep. a quick drink. Wait for a queen. <laughs> <laughs> Sounds familiar. <laughs> This is probably another good one to go in our split. Lots of capped brood. And I'll just rest it up here. Lots of pollen up here as well. Still looking for the queen. Can't see her on this frame. And this is all capped brood. If we move these bees, I just touch them to move them. You can also blow on them. You might want to make sure you've got your veil on if you're blowing on bees. Sometimes they can spring out and get you in the face. So we'll shake these off as well. Whoa. Sometimes that comb can bend, so you just want to be really careful to um, not hold the comb horizontally and hold it, always hold it vertically. Whoa, that looks like, like some Pac-Man game or something pattern going on there. You guys are getting really stirred up today. Yeah. Might get my jacket. Thanks. Yeah, keep yourself safe, Pete. Yeah, that's it. What do you got one there? There they are, they're buzzing us. Callum, who's on the camera, he's getting a bit buzzed. You alright, Callum? Usually yeah. our hives are quite um yeah. quite placid. It's it probably is. it's very windy today, so it might be that. Oh getting stung in the face now. Makes good TV, right? <laughs> oh. There we go. <laughs> Bit of smoke. Bit of smoke on me. Hey, 
Well, you know, we were talking before we had the question that came in about the double brood boxes, and yeah. then we've got um, another person asking, what about a two queen system? Have you ever experimented with two brood boxes, each with a queen coexisting within a single flow super? I haven't personally, but I've heard that it works, and um, as long as you keep those two queens segregated from each other, it so just can with be... a queen excluder or something? Yeah, between. that's right. So a, que a queen excluder on top of the first brood box, and then another brood box with a queen excluder before the super, and that super has common bees. Um, not sure how it works, because generally if the bees are swapping pheromones, it, um, it tells them that they're getting a bit distract distracted. It tells them that they're um, already got a queen and they don't necessarily like having two queens, but I have heard that it works. So it's definitely worth an experiment. So I didn't put that, this frame in the split because it's all drone cells. So we'll just keep going through. Here we go. This is a good frame. Oh. Just trying to look for some eggs. It's important to get eggs in our split as well so those bees will make a new queen. I couldn't see them in that side. But it's definitely a good frame for our split because it's got lots of cat brood again. So we'll shake them off. Get a better view now with no bees on there. Still not seeing eggs down here. You can see a bee emerging, a couple. So that's really great. It tells us this this um this frame of bees will emerge really quickly, and we'll get our split going. There she goes. It's such a beautiful sight. <laughs> Brand new baby bee. Sometimes it can take a really long time <laughs> if they get a little bit stuck. So we'll put that in our split. Make sure the queen's not on there. Maybe give it another shake. If you've just tuned in, we're just doing what's called a vertical split, where we put some, shake all the bees off. We put the brood into a second brood box and we're gonna put that above the excluder. This is just a way to split where you don't need to find the queen because you shake all the bees off the queen gets shaken off too. And then the, um, the nurse bees will come up and cover that brood and take care of it. And then we can come back and pull that box off. And this hive is being very feisty and stung me in the face. <laughs> If you've got any questions or comments, please type them down below and I'll try and answer them. So all the bees we've shaken off have just come onto this comb. We're still, we're still just keeping an eye out for the queen because if we find her, it'll just make life even quicker. Still lots of capped brood. We still haven't seen some eggs, so we might want to track that down. Oh, this hive is feisty. go. I might put that down here so you can get a shot of it. And the 
look for some eggs in there. So I can definitely see some young brood up in here, some, some larvae, and hopefully on the other side too. So the bees will make a new queen cell out of larvae that are just hatched out of an egg. So the reason we say you want eggs in your split is because they will hatch out and then the bees will make a queen from that very, very young larvae. But if you've got very young larvae in your split, then the bees will just jump straight on to that and make a queen out of it if it's all they've got. Okay, so probably a good idea to get these guys buttoned up because they're pretty feisty. Oh. Put this frame back where it was. But right, we might Keep these together in the middle and put our blank ones in between. So because these edge ones are, are honey frames, I'm not worried about splitting up the brood nest at the moment. Just jiggling that frame so that there's no bees underneath. I think we got it. We got a comment in here. Sorry, I had to move away then. I think we're all getting a bit buzzed here. Yeah. It's their um. Yeah, They're I don't know really what's feisty. going on. Maybe it's um, something to do with this. We've got a listener come in, the, their, their name is the Kids Tell Bad Jokes, and it, their name's Amber, saying, from the UK, do you have the tradition of telling the bees like we do in the UK, and have you told them about the passing of Queen Elizabeth? Maybe oh. this is why the bees are unhappy. Maybe that's why they don't like the, it. The 70 reigning year Queen has died. Their Queen passed away. Yeah. So, we've got our Queen Excluder up above our brood nest as usual and now we want to put our split box on top and try not to squash bees it's very very difficult and so what will happen now is all those nurse bees that are in the nest will come up through the excluder and start covering this brood. And we can come back, if we did this in the early morning, um, we could come back in the afternoon and, and pull it off and put it on its own bottom board. And all we'd get in there would be our brood and nurse bees. And as long as there's eggs or very young larvae in the split box, those nurse bees will start making a queen. And then we can put our super back on top. If you if you put the brood box, the or split box, up above your super, there's a chance that the nurse bees won't actually smell um, that brood and won't actually make it up. So it's good to just put them straight above the brood nest where they can easily access it. I'm just smoking these bees in the super just to get them back out of the way. lift it quite high, it's pretty heavy. There we go. 
Super's getting get really heavy, so if you're not into lifting that much, it's good to get some help if you can. Whoa, those guys were, were feisty. So, if you've got any questions, please write them below and we'll try and answer them. But we might go down to this bottom level and check on a split that I made yesterday, oh. or two days ago, just to oh. see if it's got some queen cells. Hey Pete, that might be a good one. Liz has got a question saying she wants to move a hive about 10 metres. Yep. What's the, what's the best way or any tips on that? Um, probably the best way to do it, get a bee out of my bale, is if you can, just, let, just um, move them a metre every day because the forager bees, they're the ones that have, they're the older bees and they've been outside so they geolocate to that spot and when they um, fly out for the morning they'll come back to the spot that they're geolocated to. If you move them a metre the foragers will work it out and go to the hive. But if you move them more at, at a time, um, all your forager bees will come back to that old spot and wonder where their house is. So the best way, but not the easiest, is to move them a meter every day um, until you get to your new, new position. There is a way you can try. Um, you'll probably lose a few foragers, but if you wait till nightfall and block the entrance. Everybody's at home uh, in the night. Block the entrance up so they can't fly out. <coughs> Excuse me. And um, move them to your new location and then disguise their entrance with maybe some brush or leaves or you know something, some bark. Just make that entrance look completely different to the bees. And most of the bees, when you unblock the entrance, will crawl out and think, oh, this is really different, and they'll reorient to the new location, but some won't, and they'll fly back to the old location. So you may still get a ball of bees back at the old location, but it's worth a try. You can also stick a little a nuke box or something, if you've got it, back at the old location to catch those foragers that are coming back. You can keep returning them to your new spot each day. Um, hope that helps. Yeah, great. Can we go down the hill? So here's a split that I made a couple of days ago. I just want to check that they're making queen cells. Um, I've just put the super on for storage here. It's actually blocked off from the bees. So it's just empty and it's just getting stored there. So it doesn't go missing. So this is the actual hive. It's just a brood box. What do you reckon Barbara's been feeding her bees uh, with white sugar for the for a week because the, the bees were not you know needing some food but she's just wondering once the bees have stocked up with pollen will they stop feeding on the sugar? Um, not necessarily if they've stocked up with pollen but if there is a nectar flow on they probably will start ignoring the sugar. It can also depend on whether you're feeding just dry sugar or whether you're feeding uh, sugar water. So probably a good thing to feed them if there's no flow on is a mixture of sugar and water in a one to one ratio. So one litre of sugar to one kilogram of water. <laughs> no, the other way around. <laughs> and um, usually the bees will take that down if, um, if there's no nectar flow on. And then once the nectar kicks in, they'll probably just ignore it. Um, they like nectar over everything so I'm just seeing a honey frame here. Lots of drones out on the edge. So I just want to make sure that they've started building queen cells because if they haven't, then I'll have to put some more open brood and eggs in there. Lots of drones, lots of nectar coming in. You can see that nice shiny nectar. So even though this hive is 
Queenless, they're still much nicer than the one up the hill. Yeah, a little <laughs> bit calmer. <laughs> Um, so this split too actually is um, normally your split doesn't look so busy after two days but what I've done is split two maybe three frames from a couple of hives and put them all into one box and um, just made a really really strong split. Oh so you had no empty frames in there Pete, you just put eight frames straight in that's right other hives yep. yep so we can see a nice fat queen cell so obviously it's one that I missed because um, it's almost ready to go so just judging on the time frame that I did my split um, I missed these queen cells when I was splitting that out so that's good so now I can breathe easy so these guys have got queen cells that's all I wanted to see in there. We might go back and check on our honey. There's a small hive beetle. I'll just squash them. Matthew's asking, Pete, with, lo with the flow on now getting lots of honey, how often are you getting um, honey into, your, into the hives here? Um, yeah, there's a lot of honey coming in and we're um, struggling to keep up with harvesting at all, I think. Um, at this time of year in this area, we're getting so much honey that um, we sort of need to be constantly harvesting because, for instance, the yellow hive that we're harvesting from I think Cedar harvested it maybe last week or the week before. Yeah, he did. And um, those frames that he harvested are full uh, wow. again, so. Look at the bees out the front. We'll have to look at that when we go up there. Yeah, we the really, yellow one as well. Yeah, we really stirred these ones up up yeah. there. So it's quite a normal thing for the bees to do. Um, when you've been in the hive, they just go out the front and kind of reorganize themselves. Um, also when you're harvesting, it's quite natural for them to go out outside. Um, Cool, go back up. So great now having all these spaces for our apiary here. Yeah, we need it. We're having to split a lot. Yeah. Hey Pete, got a caller in saying that they inspected their tray this morning and, and it was like looked like little white like little maggots. What 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 are they? Do you know what they would be? So they can be one of two things. Um, they're, what they probably are are small hive beetle maggots. Um, so the, the small hive beetle are the little black beetle we just saw before. And once they lay eggs in the hive, they can lay thousands of eggs, those little maggots hatch out. And if they're in, inside the, the colony and the colony's weak, um, those maggots can chew through everything. And they secrete a yeast which then turns everything to slime. And it's a real, it's called a slime out. It's a really kind of gross thing that you've got to clean up. Bees hate it and they tend to um, what's called abscond. So they'll leave the hive because the conditions are too terrible. Um, but if they're in your tray, it may not be such a big deal. Usually you can, um, usually the, the hive beetle will sort of get chased down through the screen in the bottom of the hive and fall into the tray and same with the maggots, the maggots can kind of fall down there and, um, and it is worth jumping into your brood box and making sure that the small hive beetle larvae aren't in your comb and you'll see the honey will kind of look a little bit slimy on top, um, things will just start looking a little slimy, you'll start seeing white maggots in your combs and um, dealing with that can be quite a big deal. The other thing it could possibly be is wax moth larvae, so wax moth grubs. And generally the wax moth only get in and cause problems if your hive is super weak or, you know, almost dead or, or they've already gone and then the wax moth will get into the combs. Um, the wax moth 
grubs will grow quite large. They'll, to begin with, they look like small hive beetle grubs, but they, then they grow quite large. Um, I don't know, maybe this long and then they'll pupate inside a cocoon. So you look for little white cocoons. You know that's the wax moth. Generally they're not a big deal if they're in the tray because the bees tend to sort of keep them out from the entrance. So um, yeah, looks like we're pretty full here. Just looking down the tube, I can still see it dripping so we won't shut it off just yet. We may have to swap our jars out. I think this one's finished. So we might just shut it off. Oh, that's a nice big jar of honey for the office. Yeah. Pete, just Daryl was wondering is um, with that with the um, split that, that you've done, the, the first one that you've done and you've put the queen excluder in the second one, the drones in that second box, can they get through the queen excluder? Yeah, it's a really good question. They can't get through it, no. And um, if, if we were leaving that brood box on there, then that would be a big problem. So we'd have to crack the top um, above the super there and let them out because they want to fly every day. But because we're coming back either this afternoon or tomorrow to pull that box off and make it into a new split, then it's not such a big issue. Um, Cause they'll be able to, obviously they'll have a new, they'll be a new hive and they'll be able to go out in and out um, as normal. Um, what will probably happen is they'll fly out of the split and go back to their old hive. Well, that's, um, a vertical split. It was a pretty feisty hive. <laughs> <laughs> Thanks a lot for tuning in and um, look forward to seeing you next time.